This is White Coat Investor Podcast number 246, Early Retirement Now. This episode is brought to you by 37 Parallel Properties. There's a substantial body of evidence supporting commercial real estate investing. It's one of the good guys in the industry. 37 Parallel Properties is a partner I trust. They've been around for more than 10 years and still maintain a 100% profitable track record with clear reporting and excellent educational content. Many of my readers have invested with 37 Parallel and so have I. I've been happy with my investment. Check them out. Hop on over to www.whitecoatinvestor.com slash 37 parallel. Thanks for what you do out there. <clears throat> Here we are in January, flu season, RSV season, still COVID season, and uh, your work's not easy. If nobody said thank you today, let me be the first. If you are looking at this upcoming uh, student loan holiday deadline and you're not sure what to do, we recommend studentloanadvice.com. You can receive a customized student loan plan using the principles of the White Coat Investor. You can have a professional guide you through the best options to manage your loans. You can save hours of research and stress and potentially save hundreds to thousands of dollars with your custom student loan plan. Most importantly, you'll get answers to all of your student loan questions, gain some clarity about your financial future, and start down the right path towards financial independence. You know, in a lot of ways, paying off your student loans quickly is like a trial run for financial independence. If you can get them paid off in just two to five years, then you can certainly become financially independent in 15 to 20. All right, we've got a special guest today that I've been looking forward to to speaking with ever since we scheduled this. Let's get him on the line. Okay, today's guest is Big Earn, aka Karsten. I should call him Dr. Karsten. Uh, He's the mind behind the Early Retirement Now blog. It's called Big Earn because he's a pretty tall dude at 6'6", uh, which was pretty clear when we were both standing hunched over on the plane next to each other on the flight back from FinCon this year. He was hunched much more than I was. He's from Germany originally, but came to the U.S. for his schooling at Purdue and then Minnesota, where he completed a Ph.D. in economics. He worked for the Federal Reserve for a while and taught economics. Then he joined the research department of an investment manager and got a CFA designation. He spent 10 years there before punching out to live the fire lifestyle a few years ago. Spent the first few months of that on a world tour, visiting 20 plus countries before settling down in the Northwest with his wife and daughter. Early Retirement Now is a popular FI blog, primarily because of Karsten's rigorous academic approach. Today, we're going to explore some of his favorite topics to blog about and get his take on a lot of controversial areas of personal finance and investing. Karsten, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, how did you end up in economics to start with? Yeah, so I've always been interested in math. and um, But then as I graduated from high school, I was looking for something a little bit more applied than just pure math. So I enrolled in business and economics in college back in Germany. And then I found uh, business a little bit too lightweight. Sorry to say that. <laughs> economics was more fun. And uh, so transferred to economics. And I also had the opportunity to come to the US for PhD studies uh, in uh, uh, in economics. And so there was at the University of Minnesota where, as a fun fact, I actually overlapped with a physician on fire. Of course, I didn't know him back then. But uh, so we spent, I think, three years apparently together at the University of Minnesota. So he was in the med school and I was uh, over on the West Bank in the econ department. Well, you uh, you guys were there at the same time, but uh, you know it's interesting is you both ended up getting bitten by the fire bug later. When when did you get bit by the fire bug? Yeah, pretty early on. Uh, I generally liked all jobs that I did, and uh, but I realized that I'm not going to do this until I'm 67. And uh, uh, it became very obvious then in 2008. So I had just left the Federal Reserve. It's a very safe job, obviously. And I went to work for Bank of New York Mellon Asset Management. And during my first week on the job, Bear Stearns failed. And then six months later, uh, Lehman Brothers failed. In fact, in 2017, I had interviewed for Lehman Brothers and for AIG. And uh, so out of the three job opportunities, I actually picked the right one and I stayed with BNY Mellon. (laughs) <laughs> but it's, it's definitely shook you up a little bit, right? So, uh, so you realize I'm not going to do this job really until I'm 67. Uh, so, and uh, basically, what I did is I, I didn't even have to change much, right? Uh, I saved about 50 to 60 percent of my net income, which was very easy to do because it was a highly compensated job. 
And uh, so I basically kept my lifestyle that I had from the Fed and uh, just lived the same lifestyle. And it was it was a comfortable lifestyle. It was not like I was overly frugal or anything. And uh, and I thought, well, if I if I do this job for ten years, I should have enough money to retire. And then, sure enough, in two thousand eighteen, I uh, finally pulled the plug. You know, around here we call that live like a resident. And if you keep doing it for ten years after you get out of residency, you uh, you can basically retire right then. With no no That's special right. investments, right. no, of... no particularly complicated thing. You just got to keep right. living the same right. lifestyle while you're making more. So 2018 yeah, was your early retirement day, right? What uh, what surprised That's you right. about early retirement, both for good and bad, and and what hasn't surprised you? So we planned this very well. So I don't think that we had any major surprises. I was obviously surprised in a very positive way how well the stock market has performed. So we're now three years, actually three and a half years almost to the day into early retirement. And our net worth has grown by 70%. And uh, so that's uh, obviously something that I hadn't taken into account. So it's not in my wildest dreams. So that's, that's the good surprise. I'm also surprised that I'm still quite busy. All right? So between household chores, blogging, uh, picked up a consulting gig uh, and uh, teach an online class at UC Berkeley Extension. Uh, so I, I've never felt bored. So that's that's the good that's the good news. Uh, I was a little bit worried. How am I going to fill my week? And uh, it's never been an issue. Uh, and I think it's still a very good balance. So I have the flexibility to do something for fun even during the week. And any Tuesday morning, the weather looks good. I can go skiing or hiking, do some other fun stuff. Uh, and uh, we can still travel extensively, and we have the flexibility to do that without the without the constraints of a corporate job. So, so by and large, everything has worked out as as expected, and there are no major surprises there. Yeah. So the tagline on your blog is "You can't afford not to retire early." Do you think most people should retire early if they can? Yeah, funny thing is, I mean, that blog has been in business for five years, and I haven't changed the tagline. And I think it's still, <laughs> I think it's still a pretty good tagline. As obviously, most people shouldn't retire early, right? Because we need people to work as business leaders, as innovators, medical professionals too, right? So many of them take a lot of time to become proficient in what they're doing. Uh, and so then the, the, the age forty to sixty—that's the most productive time of their of their earnings years, and uh, the they probably shouldn't retire too early. Uh, the economy needs you, so that not everybody should retire <laughs> early. But uh, the the reason why I use this quote goes back to my background in economics. And I think about it as opportunity cost. Right. So the way we teach opportunity cost uh, to college kids is this example. Well, imagine you want to go out on Friday night and party. And the opportunity cost is that, well, you could have instead picked up a shift at your waitering job and uh, so the opportunity causes that lost income and uh, so that's i think that's a really beautiful example of opportunity cost but then in mid-career i realized that it switches so i had enough money and i realized that every day i go to work it creates this opportunity cost that i can't spend time with my loved ones i can't travel as much as i want and uh, I don't have enough time for hiking and skiing and snowshoeing in the winter. And uh, so it, it actually turns out there's also an opportunity cost in terms of making too much money and not having enough fun. So there's this beautiful quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, time is our most precious resource for it is the most irrevocable. So, so think about that, whether you can afford to keep working when considering that limited time you have on the on the planet and uh, so that's that's the way i think uh in uh, this is why i still like this tagline well i guess we'll stop the podcast right there i'm off to the ski resort see you later <laughs> <laughs> all right i uh, know but I, I certainly feel that these days you know i mean i've now i have reached financial independence you and lee for about the same time when you guys uh you know le left your main work there and uh, that's about the same time I reached financial independence as well and continue to work since then. But I think a lot about that opportunity cost, um, you know, and so, yeah. so far it's, I've looked at it as so long as I can do everything I want to do and still keep working, I've kept working. But, uh, you know, the more stuff I find to do out there, the more I feel that opportunity cost. Uh, 
for sure. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> All right. Well, one of your one of your favorite topics on your blog is to to write about safe withdrawal rates, withdrawal strategies. In fact, you have a series of blog posts on the topic that's almost up to 50 posts. And you get into lots of weeds in those posts. Right. But I wanted to ask you just a few higher level questions on the topic. And the first one is what do people get wrong most frequently when talking about safe withdrawal rates? Right. So where do I even start, right? So because there are so many issues with the 4% rule, but the the major issues are, I mean, the first one is not understanding how much of a difference your personal idiosyncratic parameters make in your withdrawal rate, right? So you take a 30-year-old with a short work history, a uh, long retirement horizon, decades until you can get uh, social security or pensions and Probably you don't even have a pension uh, um, uh, in, in this day and age, uh, and that person will probably want to do a safe withdrawal rate much less than four percent. And then on the other hand, uh, you, on the other side of the spectrum, you take a fifty-year-old right who's not too far away from pensions and social security, probably has much higher pension accruals and social security benefits, uh, has a paid-off house. Uh, you should probably target much more than 4%. So it, it, my number one beef with the 4% rule, it's not so much the, the 4% part, uh, it's more of the rule part. And uh, the, the, the 4%, so again, I, mean, I don't want to look like that I'm the, I'm the overly conservative and, and, the, and the Grinch of the, the FIRE community. Um, I actually, I gave more advice to people uh, that should have done a higher than 4% withdrawal rate because they, they fell into that, to that latter category, right? They're a little bit older, their professional career, they have some very generous benefits, uh, and uh, they could have easily done uh, a 5% or 6% initial withdrawal rate. So if they had just relied on that, on that Trinity study result, they probably would still be working uh, instead of retiring early. Um, so that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the one dimension. That's the idiosyncratic dimension. The other dimension is market valuation. So as people are not factoring in uh, asset valuation. So a lot of people point to the Trinity study and then they say, well, the 4% rule is very safe. It has a 98% uh, success rate. Uh, and that's true. But the question is, how would this success rate change if we look at not all of the prior historical simulations, but we look at only the prior retirement cohorts that faced conditions that are similar to what we face today, right? Very expensive equity multiples, so CAPE ratios in the 30s and above, uh, and uh, very low interest rates. And then when you slice the prior retirement cohorts and you take out all the irrelevant cohorts that might have retired at the bottom of the bear market, well, then, of course, you can do a much higher safe withdrawal, right? And you look at only the uh, cohorts that retired during conditions that were similar to today's conditions, you have a much higher conditional uh, failure rate and a much lower uh, conditional success rate. So uh, look at not just these unconditional Trinity study uh, results, but also do some conditioning on... uh, uh, to, to factor in that we have very expensive equity valuations. And then also, uh, this is one of my favorite pet peeves, is, is not understanding uh, percentage calculations. Because you hear a lot of people say, well, 3%, 4%, 5% withdrawal rate, well, what does it really matter? It's just a percent difference. And of course, that's wrong, because imagine you have a $2 million nest egg, uh, and then going from a 3% to a 4% means you go from $60,000 a year to $80,000 a year annual budget. And uh, that's not a 1%, that's a 33% difference. So um, when, when I do some of my simulations and people roll their eyes, oh my God, how can you do uh, the, the percentage of the, the, the safe withdrawal rate? How can you do that down to the 3.3% or 3.35%? That isn't that overkill in terms of precision? Well, it's overkill in terms of precision if you just look at the, at the headline number. But if you look at how much that actually means in terms of uh, your annual withdrawals, it could be very substantial amounts. If you go from a 35 to a 3.75% safe withdrawal rate, it is a meaningful dollar amount. And then also, if you look at some of the, uh, the back tests that I'm doing, uh, so sometimes you 
it's just a 0.25% difference in the withdrawal rate. And you go from something that is super safe to something that's already really, really shaky in the, uh, in the historical simulation. So, so don't, uh, don't get too offended by somebody doing some more careful and robust and, and, and mathematically sound analysis. It's, this is actually one of the places where you want to have a little bit more precision. And then again, if, if in the end you calculate your safe withdrawal rate and it comes out as 3.81, uh, nobody is going to blame you if you go from 3.81 to 3.8 or 3.9. Uh, that's okay. But maybe you can do some rounding in the end. But on the way to get your safe withdrawal rate, you probably want to um, cross all the T's and dot all the I's and be a little bit more careful. The rounding should be done at the end because you don't want to compound any kind of rounding or, or estimation errors. Now, along your second point about valuations, we had Bill Bernstein on here a couple of weeks ago, and he likes to make the point if you don't like, you know, expected returns going forward today, you know, with bond yields being so low, with expected returns on stocks being so low, consider the alternative, which is having a lot less money. You know, that you haven't actually had this run up in asset prices. And yes, you've got higher expected returns going forward, but you might only have it on two thirds of the money. And so I think that comes into right. play as well when, when thinking about this is yes, maybe you have to take a little bit smaller withdrawal rate, but you're also taking it on a lot more money than you would be taking it on otherwise. Right. 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 So in that sense, I'm a little bit worried about the people who just, barely barely scrape by and the, with the recent run up in equities they just barely make it to the 25x or barely make it to the 4%. So that's that's the danger part, right? But uh, is it, but you're right. I mean obviously most people should now look at their portfolio. Hey, I mean this is a lot more than I ever expected and I can afford to do a little bit less of a safe withdrawal rate. And you don't, you don't have to do a lot less, right? When I first did this whole safe withdrawal rate analysis, I thought, "Oh my god, it's maybe if you have something like a uh, like a repeat of the Great Depression, maybe no safe withdrawal rate is safe. Maybe we have to go down to one percent or below one percent. But that's not true. I mean, all you have to do is you go from four percent to three point three percent, and you're fine, even in the worst possible uh, scenario uh, like the Great Depression. So it's it, it doesn't take a lot of reduction, uh, and uh, yeah. So with the with the recent run up, uh, I think I think we're, a lot of people will be in good shape. So you think the people saying use a 2% safe withdrawal rate are just as crazy as I think they are? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's get into specifics. I mean, you are now uh, an early retiree. What strategy are you right. using to spend your nest egg? Right, so back in 2018, we looked at our net worth and how much we expect in future cash flows, pension. I have a small pension, uh, social security for my wife and me. And I looked at how much can we withdraw so that even in the historically worst case scenario, we wouldn't run out of money. And not only not run out of money, but hopefully have a little bit left that we can use to, to give to our daughter and to charities. And I think I calculated something like a 3.5% safe withdrawal rate. Uh, and then now, I mean, as, as I said in the beginning, uh, portfolio has grown by 70%. I don't see a reason of raising our budget by 70%. So my personal retirement planning has now shifted from managing the risk of running out of money to almost managing the risk of overaccumulation, right? So should we uh, should we raise our consumption? Should we built in more fudge factors and more more fun factors in the future um and um so so in, in that sense uh I'm, I'm probably right now i'm my worst customer because i i, I don't i don't even need all this uh, safe withdrawal rate uh mechanics anymore because i'm probably pretty safe now uh, but again i'm a little bit worried about the people that just because of the recent run-up they just make it to something that looks like a reasonable uh, uh retirement and how how are they going to uh, manage the next 10 20 30 years so you just spend what you want and then uh and look every now and then at what you're spending and make sure it's it's less than your calculated safe withdrawal rate that's it that's your whole strategy right. yeah that's it it's pretty easy and um, I mean, and again, I mean, we, we don't have too much of an issue in terms of uh, asset location. We have enough money in uh, taxable accounts that we can tap um, without having to tap any of the retirement accounts where we have to worry about penalties or, or some of these uh, uh, other uh, 
uh, ways that you can tap these accounts penalty free. So we don't even have to worry about that. So yeah, I mean, as right now, our retirement strategy is pretty easy. It's just pretty much coasting. And you're only spending from your taxable account at this point. Yeah. So do you think your strategy is right for most people? And if not, what should they be doing differently than what you're doing? Well, I mean, the, my specific strategy, obviously, it works only for me, right? I mean, I've, as I said before, I've done case studies for people that can probably pull out as much as 5%, 6%. Um, I think that my general approach is very attractive. So in, in the sense that uh, you look at your horizon, how much money do you want to leave uh, to your kids and charities? What are your supplemental cash flows? And then you look at the historical failsafe. And uh, so that gives you the certainty that even if things are as bad as another Great Depression, you're still going to make through it. Uh, for example, I mean, I got a lot of podcast requests uh, in the fourth quarter of 2018 and the second quarter of 2020, right? The, that's that's when people kind of panicked about, oh my God, is this the end of fire? And I slept pretty well through that because I, I looked at my simulations and I said, well, you know, I, uh, I, my portfolio is robust to a, a repeat of the Great Depression or, or a repeat of the 1970s. And uh, uh, the only thing I have to worry about is, well, is there a possibility that the future will be even worse than what we what we saw in the past? So that's I can't I can't gauge what is the probability for that. But uh, that's 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 my little bit of that that final uh, little bit of residual uh, failure probability that I have. And uh, I mean, obviously, what you can do is if you have some flexibility, you can say, well, you know, I withdraw a little bit more. And then if the market goes to hell, then I'm just going to reduce my withdrawals. If you have that flexibility, uh, that would obviously be something that you could do. Uh, and I think a lot of people should have that flexibility, right? I mean, some people can pick up another job, can maybe reduce their consumption. Uh, the, the warning that I always uh, uh, issue is that people always believe that, well, you have to be flexible only as long as the bear market lasts. And of course, that's not true, right? Because your portfolio not only has to go through the trough, it has to recover again, and it has to catch up with inflation again. So that flexibility valve that people might use uh, might be a lot more painful and a lot longer lasting than a lot of people realize. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, withdraw more if you want to be flexible, but um, don't be surprised if that flexibility uh, valve has to has to last a lot longer than uh, than you realize. Good tip. Uh, now, some people, you know, you have a small pension. A lot of people don't have a pension anymore and consider buying one from an insurance company using a SPIA. What do you think about that strategy of annuitizing part of the nest egg with a single premium immediate annuity? Yes, sir. I recently looked at the uh, at the annuity yields and they look atrocious. So for me, forty seven year old male, I think if I handed over a hundred thousand dollars to to that SPIA, I would get three hundred forty seven dollars per month. So that's about four point two percent annualized. So at first glance, it looks great, right? Oh, it's a more than four percent withdrawal rate. Uh, the problem is that. Uh, you have to factor in that that's a nominal payout, right? So this is going to be eroded uh, through inflation. So the only way uh, to to really compare that to a safe withdrawal rate is that you have to then still set aside some money that you transform into annuities later uh, to make up for that lost uh, for that lost income because of uh, because of inflation eroding your your annuity payment, and then then with that annuity you will also be well below. Four uh, percent, and so that makes this whole annuity proposition a uh, really bad deal. It's just because interest rates are so low right now, and um, uh, so in, 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 even in the worst case scenario, which would be something like a 1970s repeat, you could do better than with an annuity with just a regular portfolio. And uh, it's it's almost like so. The analogy I always use is that is is like imagine you're on this deal or no deal show, right? And the last two briefcases have a hundred thousand dollars and two hundred thousand dollars in them. And then to buy me out of that gamble, you probably have to offer me well, hundred thirty, maybe hundred forty thousand dollars. So maybe a little bit less than the expected value. But if they offer me only a hundred thousand dollars, and I'm saying, well, 
that's that's the worst case scenario. Then I'm just going to take the gamble. And uh, if it goes well, I'm going to get the $200,000. And it's the same with the annuity. The annuity is probably only as good as the worst case scenario we have had during the 1970s. And uh, if it's not the worst case scenario, then uh, not handing over money to an annuity company, uh, to an insurance company and doing an annuity, uh, I, I would still have my portfolio and then I'd have something that I can give to my to my daughter or to charity. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, I, I'm not very positive on annuities. And until late 2020, I could have at least said that, you know, the, the one redeeming factor of annuities is that, well, at least inflation has been very contained. Uh, but then 2021 came around and we have uh, most recent number was 6.2% inflation year over year. Yeah, that's going to erode your annuity very quickly if if we don't get that under control. So, um, so now even that inflation stability is out the window. So that makes the annuity even uh, even less attractive. But I, I always uh, repeat that point that you have made on your blog uh, often that uh, social security is obviously that is the one annuity that's actually a pretty good deal. Uh, make sure you maximize that. There's some spousal claiming. Uh, benefits and and the way you time uh, claiming benefits uh, uh, that uh, that you can use to maximize your lifetime benefits and then social security is also uh, inflation adjusted and um, so that's that's probably the the one annuity that's that's still pretty good and I, and again I I will also have the option to pay out my pension at age fifty five and yeah I'll I'll also go take a very sharp pencil. And check out what are the pros and cons of taking the benefits right away versus taking the annuity. I think that these these corporate pensions are probably they tend to be a little bit better than the than the SPIAs you can get in the free market. Uh, so I, it might not be such a no brainer. I, I might actually take that annuity and not pay it out as a lump sum, uh, but I'll I'll fight that battle uh, in uh, in a number of years. Yeah, I think part of that might be selection bias. For the single premium immediate annuities, healthy people tend to buy them. Yeah. Uh, so you're clearly not a fan for an early retiree to buy one. What about somebody that's 70? Does your opinion change at all, or you still think it's a lousy deal? Um, I mean, obviously, you don't have quite the long uh, life expectancy because, uh, again, you have this inflation uncertainty. I mean, how how do I even gauge the inflation uncertainty? I'm 47 now. My wife is my wife is 39. Um, th- that that annuity, uh, I don't even know how much is going to pay out in real terms. Um, maybe at age seventy, if you get a decent yield on it, and you're scared about sky high stocks, I, I, it would be more defensible. But again, you have to look at the at the exact numbers. And and again, sometimes these annuity salesmen, right? They just quote the, you the yield. Right, and they say, well, that's a much better yield than the bond market or or even the stock market return. But but again, this is you, you hand over the asset and the asset is gone. Right? You will never get that back. Can't really compare that to a bond yield. You can't compare it to an equity, certainly not the dividend yield and and not even the, the equity expected return. So uh, yes, I, I agree that if you're a little bit older, uh, you you might consider uh, the uh, the annuity, but again, I mean, I, I I'm almost I'm almost sure that, that might not be a very good deal either for even for a seventy year old. Now let's turn the page a little bit. Uh, you've written before about how you're not a fan of emergency funds. I've always seen an emergency fund as a bit of a catch twenty two. In the beginning, when you really need one, it's hard to get one, and there's a lot of opportunity cost to saving one up. And by the time it's easy for you to have one, you no longer really need it. I mean, certainly someone that's already FI or even anywhere close has no need for an emergency fund. Their entire nest egg functions as an emergency fund. How do you think people should think about emergency funds? So the way you put it is is a lot more eloquent than than my ramblings on the blog. But that's that's (laughs) probably 90% of of what what I wrote in uh, in a whole sequence of emergency funds. It's actually that, that post, that was my first claim to fame. Uh, back in 2016, and that was that was featured in uh, Physician on Fire's uh, Sunday's Best, and that was the first time ever uh, anybody had reposted something I wrote. So uh, it's it's still <laughs> a, a post that's very near and dear to my heart. And, and again, you're completely right. So young investors face this opportunity cost, 
of missing out on stock market returns. And because you still have your entire career ahead of you and you're more able to, to suffer that equity volatility. And then I also think there's a bit of a behavioral component. So if, if you don't keep your money in a money market account, but you, instead you put it in an equity index fund, and then he's already potentially, hopefully, it has grown a little bit and you have some capital gains. There is this additional mental burden of spending that emergency fund on something frivolous, right? Like a, like an emergency flat screen TV or or an emergency <laughs> trip to Las Vegas or something like that, right? And of course, but then again, if you really do need the emergency fund, right? I mean, the, the roof caved in and something needs to get fixed right away. Uh, again, I can get money out of an equity index fund just as quickly as I can get it out of a out of a fidelity money market fund, so it's it's still accessible. But I like this, this little bit of this additional burden uh, that you're not going to tap your emergency fund uh, as quickly as you might touch a money market fund. But uh, again, I, I agree with everything you said. The downside, of course, with that approach is it might be worth forty percent less than you, than you thought it was going to be worth when it comes time to have the emergency. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. And again, if you have only one single emergency in your entire life, and um, maybe you could you could argue that way. But then again, I mean, you you potentially have several emergencies through your entire lifetime, and sometimes all well, your equity holdings they're underwater. Sometimes they are wildly better than your money market fund. And um, uh, and and again, um, of course, if you have an emergency every six months, then that's probably not uh, an issue with emergency, but that's probably incorrect budgeting. But uh, so again, so if you average this pros and cons emergency fund in the money market versus the stock market, and you average this over, say, a 30 year horizon, and every three years you have a major emergency where you have to fix the boiler or the roof uh, or the AC unit. Um, and um, uh, yeah, sometimes you're underwater with the stock market, but you would think that maybe 60 or 70% of the time you are way ahead of the money market account with your equity index fund. Yeah, fair enough. You're also not a big fan of robo advisors. Why not? Well, they charge an additional fee, right? Usually it's something like uh, 25 basis, point, basis points uh, AUM, right? And for that fee, you get two services. The first is the asset allocation recommendation. And the second one is tax loss harvesting. And the funny thing is, uh, why should I pay 25 basis points? Again, you don't. this is not a one-time fee, right? This is an annual fee. Why should I pay 25 basis points when... So actually, I, I just the other day I went to a robo advisor webpage and you can they tell you the recommended asset allocation. So this is sliding bar. You can enter your risk tolerance, and it gives you the asset allocation. Why should I pay for something that they already tell me for free on the website? Or you can go to your website. I think you you had a post the other day. No, it's, it's actually an older post, but you have added to this the, the hundred fifty different portfolio allocations that that people have recommended. Right? I mean, you you, you can get so much input uh, and free advice on the internet is, is actually not so much uh, an issue of um, finding the, it's, it's actually more of an issue of weeding out the bad advice and, and uh, landing at something that is that is reasonable. But I mean, in, in the worst possible case, you just take that robo-advisor uh, recommended allocation and you can implement that yourself. You can implement that with with the Vanguard funds, with the Fidelity funds, uh, and there's there's a lot of free information out there uh, on on how to do that. Um, the second uh, service they uh, they give you is tax loss harvesting, right? And so in your taxable account, you can quote unquote harvest taxable losses, and then you can write them off against your other taxable gains, and then even up to a certain upper limit of $3,000 a year, you can even write it off against your ordinary income. And that's very useful. Um, but uh, it's also something that you can do yourself. And um, uh, and I uh, also want to point out that there are at least two uh, tax pitfalls that I think the robo-advisors are not taking into account very, uh, very seriously. And I'm, I'm actually... Uh, um, I'm actually amazed that nobody has has complained about this or even filed a, a lawsuit or something, right? So, so, for example, the first thing is that uh, unless you move your entire net worth, all of your financial assets, I should say, to the robo-advisor, 
uh, where the robo advisor can then make sure there are no wash sales, right? Because the, this tax loss harvesting claiming uh, tax losses only works if you don't have any offsetting transaction within plus or minus 30 days of that uh, tax loss harvesting transaction. And um, uh, obviously, the robo advisors, if you hold, say, your taxable account and an IRA and a Roth IRA, if you hold that all with the robo advisor, that obviously the robo advisor makes sure that. Uh, when you harvest a loss in one account, uh, you don't invalidate the the tax loss harvesting in your retirement account. But what if you hold the retirement account somewhere else? And by the way, the robo advisor also wants the fee for your uh, for your retirement account. So they might do the tax loss harvesting, and it might be worth on a standalone basis, where the AUM compensates you. Where the AU, AUM fee, uh, yeah, you can you can make up the AUM fee through the tax loss harvesting, but but what if you have to keep all of your other assets too, where you can do tax loss harvesting, say in a uh, in a Roth IRA or in a in a traditional IRA? So the problem is that what if the what if you claimed your tax losses from your robo advisor, advisor, but in your say in your corporate four hundred one k account, you made transactions that would invalidate your tax losses. Uh, so that could be a very expensive tax liability. Uh, and uh, the other tax liability is that it doesn't apply to people who say they start an account with a robo-advisor and then they put new money and say they put cash in there and then that's invested in their ETFs. Uh, what some people might do is they take an existing portfolio of ETFs and mutual funds, and then move it over to the robo-advisor. Well, what does the robo-advisor do? They liquidate all the assets that don't fit into their mold, right? that are not on their list of ETFs that they are trading in their program, uh, and then they rebalance the whole portfolio and potentially uh, realize such a large chunk of capital gains that even with all the robo-advising and tax loss harvesting that they might be doing over the rest of your lifetime, you will never recover that initial loss uh, that they, uh, that they real, it's a, the, the initial uh, tax hit that they, uh, that they generated when they did the re initial rebalance. So, so be careful about that. So um, if you want to do a robo-advisor route and you invest directly with them, um, make sure that you don't have any offsetting trades in your other accounts that are not with the robo-advisor. And never, ever transfer any existing accounts with, with built-in capital gains to the robo-advisor. Yeah, that's a real problem anytime you change advisors of any kind, right? Uh, if that advisor isn't good about working around the, the portfolio you've got, you may end up taking a hit every time you change advisors. So... Exactly, and and it's a, it's actually a reason to 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 DIY, right? Because I mean, you can move your account from one broker to another broker and do it in kind without liquidating the assets. But it's it's exactly as I said. So you imagine you go from one advisor to another advisor, and that other advisor says, "Oh, this all of these funds they're kind of junk, and I'm going to move them to the funds that I like." Uh, they, there would be a huge uh, tax heading because of that. Yeah. Speaking of DIY, do you feel the same way about target date funds, target retirement, life cycle funds, whatever you want to call them? Should investors use those or should they roll right. them out? Right. Um, so I wrote a blog post. It's It says it's titled, What's Wrong with Target Date Funds? And uh, first of all, to be sure, I think there's a lot of things that are right with target date funds. So if you're a hands-off investor, uh, maybe you lack a little bit the uh, discipline or organization. It, I think it's a not bad a, it's not a bad deal. It's certainly better than not contributing to a 401k at all or putting your 401k contributions into a money market account. But uh, I personally, I don't particularly like target date funds. Uh, first of all, you can just implement them yourself and save the, the additional layer of fees. Um, so in that, in that blog post, I, I showed that um, both Fidelity and Vanguard, they, they have the funds. You can just invest yourself in the underlying funds. And uh, there's no need to do the the, the target date funds, and you you save for I think it's up to ten basis points or so per year. It's it's not trivial. Um, and then on top of that, the target date funds are calibrated and optimized for a very generic retirement saver. So it would be somebody who starts working at age between twenty and twenty five with zero initial assets, and then this person accumulates assets um, very uh regularly 
consistently over time, probably 40 to 45 years. Uh, but not everybody will fit into that mold, right? So what if you what if you find yourself as a 45 year old and you start from scratch? Right? Maybe you never saved for retirement. Um, should you then use a target date fund for a 45 year old? Well, maybe you should be more aggressive because the 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 45 year old uh, target date fund, so say 20 years away from retirement, might already be too conservative. So at 45 with zero assets, you should be a lot more aggressive. And then likewise, imagine you're 25 and you receive a big gift or an inheritance. Uh, You might already uh, shift to a little bit more conservative asset allocation. So uh, maybe that uh, target date fund that says we are 40 years away from retirement, uh, that might be too aggressive for you. So um, again, because my little niche in the in the finance community is is you want to personalize stuff right you want to just as you personalize your safe withdrawal rate analysis uh you potentially have to do a little bit of hacking here too right so maybe make some adjustments if you want to retire at uh at age uh, 45 um you probably you, you might have to be a little bit uh uh, more risk averse than than the average forty five year old working person who still has twenty years to retirement. So this is a, uh, it's, it's very hard to fit that all into one mold because there's so many different um, idiosyncratic differences among people. I've got a, I've got some more investing questions, but let's step away from investing for a minute. Uh, something I saw when I went to your website was that you use a health sharing ministry plan, MetaShare. Like, like a lot of early retirees. Tell us what your experience has been like there, particularly when it comes to, to claims or, or need for shares. Yeah, so when I retired in 2018, I had five more months of corporate health insurance until December 2018. But then I had to um, pick a, a health plan. And um, so... We had and we still have relatively high income, so especially taxable income, so that we don't qualify for uh, the, the, any generous ACA subsidies. And uh, now there, there's been a little bit of uh, uh, a relaxation of some of the rules, but I did the math. It's still not really um, uh, cost effective for us to do the uh, uh, to do the uh, Obamacare plan. Uh, but then also to be sure, we haven't had any claims, right? So we only do our annual health checkups. And so I don't have any experience about how uh, the claims would work. So what I can say is that uh, so what I like about MediShare is that it's a PPO. So it has negotiated rates. It has, it has a network of providers. You call up the provider ahead of time. Uh, and they tell you, yes, we are in their network. And we have uh, negotiated and competitive rates and uh, yeah i mean so far so good if if anything changes i'll probably write it write about it on my blog but um, yeah so far we like it because the premium is i think is only about half of what a comp- what of what a halfway decent plan would have cost us over the exchange here in washington state and um and then, of course, I mean, it's a high deductible plan. So we pay, I think, the first $10,000 out of pocket, which we never even got close to. I think right now we pay something like $2,000 or so out of pocket. But we would have paid the $2,000 out of pocket anyways, uh, even with the with the bronze or, or silver plan that I was looking at. And we save half or even more than half of the, uh, of the cost of that plan. So, so far, we're happy. Speaking of Washington State, what did you decide to do about their new long-term care insurance law? Um, so I don't have any W-2 income from Washington State. So I get uh, W income from the uh, state of California. And then all the other income we have is, uh, is dividends, interest, uh, and uh, capital gains. So as far as I know, I don't have to pay uh, any premium for the long-term care. So as I think of the long-term care insurance is, is essentially a payroll tax uh, for um, just regular W-2 income. And so we're not impacted by that. Basically, just ignore it. That's helpful. All right, let's get back into some investing topics. <clears throat> it's pretty clear that you're not a big fan of bonds. And I'm curious whether that's a long-held belief or simply a reflection of our very low current interest rate environment. 
Right. So correct. I mean, it's mostly because of low interest rates. <clears throat> and for the most part, I used 100% equities or, or other risky assets uh, like real estate and trading equity options while I accumulated. And with low or high bond rates, I think it's actually it's actually sensible to be 100% or close to 100% until maybe a few years before retirement. Uh, and uh, then, of course, in retirement, uh, it's no longer prudent to stay 100% stocks. It's way too risky. Uh, if we have a repeat of, say, 1930s or 1970s, uh, that would not support the, the kind of safe withdrawal rate that, that people normally recommend. So, uh, yes, so in retirement, you need a little bit more in uh, safe assets. And so right now, what, what we do is I have about a... 30% allocation to an option trading account and then the the because I'm trading derivatives there and uh, I keep the the principal of this account I actually keep that in bonds so these are muni bonds and uh, I have some preferred shares too which are so kind of a hybrid between stocks and bonds is definitely a lot more risky than than the average uh, US treasury but uh, yes, I, I definitely want to hold something like thirty percent of my assets in something that is significantly less volatile than than the S and P five hundred. So yes, I've definitely shifted, and even with low bond yields, uh, there's really almost no way around the 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 idea that you want to shift down your uh, your risk budget a little bit in retirement. Yeah, even though yields are low. We'll get, we'll get into options here in a minute because I want to hear more about what you're doing there. Uh, but before we do that, let's just talk about stocks and the stock market expected returns. What should investors expect from stocks going forward for the next decade or two? What range of outcomes do you think is most likely? And what should investors do with right. that information, if anything? Right. So, uh, so we're recording this on December 2nd, 2021, right? So the current situation is very high price earnings ratios i think the cape ratio today i calculated as something like 38 which is historically outrageously high so it's almost as high as before the dot com crisis uh, it's higher than before uh, in 1929 or in the 1960s so i definitely think that we have to curb our expectations and then all expected returns are lower across the board right it's, it's bonds are have very low yields and the with the potential of great hikes so that's going to uh, be a little bit of a drag at least short term uh, on bond returns of course in exchange for longer term then you have higher bond yields uh, and then you make a little bit more again but the the path going there is a little bit painful uh, and then by the way i'm not trying to give any doomsday forecast right i'm mean, personally i'm still very aggressively invested in stocks uh, so I'm not forecasting negative returns, right? But I would say that um, real equity returns are probably going to be somewhere three and a half to four percent over the next decade, and then hopefully by that time, corporate profits, if they keep growing the the way they have been growing over the last decade, uh, and then uh, equity returns have done a little bit of a of a smaller, uh, only single digit run instead of double digit run that uh, valuations catch up to more sustainable long-term uh, ratios. And I think after that, we can probably go back again to something like 6 7% real equity returns. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that uh, the, the high valuation is that uh, causes me to be too worried, but uh, it's, it's obviously historically has been correlated with some stock market crashes. Now, the problem is that... Uh, Equity valuations, even though they are highly correlated with, say, the next 10, 15 year returns, they are notoriously unreliable in forecasting what is the next, when is the next crash and how bad is the next crash. So it's, it's very hard to, to gauge that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously, I think that um, high valuations, then uncertainty about how inflation is going to work out over the next few years. Um, high uh, deficits, uh, potentially looming tax hikes, especially hikes on corporate taxes. Uh, it's all going to be a drag on the stock market. Um, what some people are going to point to, and I, I could be convinced of that, is that we are right at the at the edge of at the at the beginning 
of another technological revolution, right? So all of this um, machine learning and artificial intelligence, that's all going to um, uh, create a big productivity boost, and we're just going to grow ourselves out of this problem. It would be nice if we could. Uh, and uh, so that would be the, the one thing that I'm holding up there that uh, might actually cause the, the whole situation to look much better than, than anybody forecasts these days. Wouldn't that be wonderful? All right, let's, let's talk about options now. You're a fan of using options in a portfolio. I'm curious. I mean, there's lots of ways to invest with options. What strategies do you prefer? All right. So there are a million different option strategies. And then what I'm doing specifically uh, involves selling put options on the S&P 500 index. So I'm selling downside insurance on the index. And I still have to be moderately bullish on stocks, obviously. So I bet on the market going either sideways or up. And it can even go slightly down. I'll still make money. Uh, so only if the market drops dramatically and then over a very short time span, uh, I would lose money. And I've been doing this for over 10 years now. It has been very profitable. So we have about 30% of our net worth in that option strategy. And uh, so far, I mean, there's a knock on wood, uh, the, the cash flow from this strategy alone has been enough to finance our retirement. So I don't need to tap into any of the other investments. And we've been riding the whole equity bull market without ever having to make any withdrawals from, uh, from the taxable uh, equity holdings. And then all of our retirement accounts, they are also um, yeah, pretty much 100% equities. And so we, we left them untouched too. So it has been working out very well so far. Yeah, well, we've also had a, a, a pretty bullish market for the last decade. My biggest problem with options has always been that the expected returns zero before costs, negative after costs, you know, similar to insurance that way, really. And unless you're better at it than the average trader, unless you can add alpha, you're going to come out behind. Do you agree with that? And if not, why not? So, so I agree with that. Uh, I, I disagree with that, that, that central assumption that options have zero expected return. Uh, but I really like that insurance analogy because that's exactly how I define my business model. And it's the reason why I believe I make money. It's the reason why I make money consistently and reliably. So again, this, this incorrect assumption is that is zero return uh, assumption for all options. And uh, there's a very quick way to demonstrate that that can't be true. So so imagine you buy a call option on the S&P 500 and you sell a put option with the same strike and the same expiration date. So you have now created a, it's a, it's a elementary option theory. So th that's a synthetic forward contract, right? And because that forward contract pays you the expected equity risk premium, which is positive, means that the option contracts, they can't both have a zero expected return. Or you could even go further. And then so you do a bond that pays off at that same expiration date. And then the two options, that, that would be a synthetic equity index fund. And you don't you don't do the index fund through Fidelity or Vanguard, but you, you have synthetically created this through a bond uh, plus two options. Uh, and uh, so again, because these two options um, make this a an equity risk premium and the equity risk premium is positive, when on average, equities should pay a lot more than, than the bond. Uh, there has to be some positive expected return somewhere inherent in these two option positions. And it gets even better. So I would make the case that the downside protection demands the higher premium. So in, in fact, the, the upside risk premium that you are buying there that, that has the same risk profile as a as a casino gamble right or a lottery ticket so you put a small wager in and then you have a very high or even unlimited upside potential uh, i don't think there's a very large risk premium that somebody pays you to take on that risk it's, it's actually in, in fact it might be the opposite way right that might actually be that sucker option bet that, and i i totally agree i think a lot of option uh, trades are like that as uh, basically sucker bets where people then will get less than than an expected zero return or maybe a zero return and then through fees and taxes and everything they're going to be dragged below the zero line um and um 
but it's the it's the downside risk that's the that's the very highly compensated right this is this is just like any other insurance contract right i buy homeowners insurance and it costs me say a thousand dollars a year and my expected money that i get out of that contract is is a lot less than a thousand dollars i'd be lucky if i get even the five hundred dollars out of that in expected terms but i still buy it because i i have such a uh, such an aversion against um, my house burning down, so I, I still buy the homeowner's insurance, and it's it's a little bit the same with the with the short put. Um, I think there are a lot of these are not even unsophisticated investors. Sometimes very sophisticated investors like pension funds and endowments they can't afford to take on the full equity premium. They sometimes do something like an equity collar where they buy where they buy a put option to hedge the downside, and then they sell a call option. To sell off a little bit of that unlimited upside potential, and uh, because there's uh, such a strong aversion against that negatively skewed payoff uh, from a big enough uh, equity drop, and uh, there's not that many people that are willing to take on this this risk, and uh, I'm one of them, and I think I get paid uh, pretty well for that because it is exactly like an insurance contract. Now, unfortunately, I can't really do what, say, a car insurance or, or homeowners insurance can do. You you diversify simultaneously over a lot of drivers and a lot of homeowners, and then some people they have a damage, you pay that out, but the overwhelming majority of contracts that you just pay in and they never get anything back. So I try to do that same thing with my short put options. So I sell them a little bit out of the money. And um, so that maybe 98% of the time I keep the premium and then 2% of the time I have to sometimes pay quite substantial amounts back. Unfortunately, I have to do this throughout the year. I can't do this simultaneously. So I can't, unfortunately, I can't sell put options on say 200 different indices and then some of them I pay out something and for most of them I keep the premiums I have to do this over time which complicates things a little bit uh, but I think the the general idea of the insurance premium that I'm making is still valid and uh, so and I, I do a very very short expiration time so I there are three expiration times for the major option contracts Monday Wednesday Friday and on Mondays, I sell the Wednesday options. On Wednesdays, I sell the Friday options. And on Fridays, I sell the, the Monday options. And uh, so I have basically 52 weeks, 156 independent bets throughout the year. And um, yes, of course, occasionally I pay out quite substantially. But uh, so far, this strategy has made very good, very good money. And again, it's because I'm actually using the the richer and the purer equity risk premium and get compensated for that and the the premium that everybody else is chasing after right the the upside potential with no downside potential is what everybody wants right so you want to uh, put a small wager and get rich from that uh, that's really the sucker bet so i'm staying away from that i'm doing the purer downside bet and i make the insurance income on that so so this is this is my my little uh, option strategy and um i mean so far it has been going very well even back in 2020 i i did uh, quite well even in march 2020 uh you know i think if you went to a gold rush you'd be the guy selling the shovels <laughs> that's that's right that's right and uh, <laughs> it's it's the it's the dirty work it's the not the very pleasant work because you are taking on the downside risk and everybody else you know they want to tell people at their at the cocktail party uh what smart investors they are and they invested in this stock and they made a thousand percent on this and well unfortunately i'm only making really very small amounts make them regularly uh, every once in a while i lose maybe a month or two months worth of premium uh, as long as I have only one or two events like that every year, uh, I'm still fine. And it's not a very, it's not a very glamorous uh, kind of job in the financial market. But it's a, uh, it's it's almost like uh, you know cleaning the sewers, uh, and that's that's what I do in the in the financial system. Now you have a PhD in economics and worked for a big investment firm for a decade. Do you think the average investor? Should do what you're doing with options. Well, it depends on how you define get into options, right? So, getting into the weeds and trading options yourself would be tough for the average retail investor, right? Because you 
uh, you're selling naked put options with leverage. So you want to know the option math, which I don't think is really that complicated. Um, and uh, I think the bigger obstacle might be, uh, do you really have the, the bandwidth to do this yourself? And again, I'm, I want to make sure that it's not like I'm sitting the entire day in front of the trading screen. So I have to do three trades a week. I can sometimes do uh, each trade in just a few minutes. So I always tell people, uh, if I'm on the ski slope on a Wednesday and I have to do my option trades, I can do all of my option trades that day on my phone on one ski lift ride. So uh, it doesn't take a lot of time, but you probably want to have a little bit of uh, uh, of focus on what's going on in the market. I, yeah, I, okay, I might do the one trade in the lift ride, but on all the other rides, I'm still on my phone and checking the option quotes and and checking the S and P 500 quotes. So imagine if you're a, if you're an emergency room doctor, you can't do that, right? Because you have to work during that time. You can't just leave the patient uh, there on the stretcher and say, I'm, "Okay, everybody, take a break. I have to check my option quotes." Or imagine you're a lawyer or a police officer. So um, and then on top of that, I don't think there are any uh, mutual funds or ETFs that would do this. Uh, that would do this for you. So yeah, I mean, you have to do it yourself, or you have to hire somebody. Um, a lot of people have approached me and they asked me, "Hey, can you do this for me?" And uh, right now, I'm not set up to do this. But if I, if I ever change my mind and I offer this as a service, I I'll probably announce this on my blog. But uh, yeah, I mean, right now, I think the only way to do that is to do it yourself, and you have to have the the bandwidth and yeah, a little bit of the knowledge in terms of risk management and stuff uh, before you want to do this yourself. It's, it's I, I don't think 99 percent of the people shouldn't do this themselves. I think the, the, as I said, I really like this risk premium, right? Because that's the purer and uh, better compensated equity risk premium. And so I like the asset class in general. And um, if more people could do it uh, without doing it themselves, I mean, just like I, I mean, I'm, I'm investing in real estate through uh, through real estate funds, but I don't, I don't want to manage a multifamily uh student housing uh in san luis obispo uh but uh, if i find people who do this for me I, I would be very interested in that kind of asset class let's talk about another controversial area you're not afraid of using leverage well, what do you think are the best opportunities to use leverage to lower risk and boost returns all right, so so just to be sure, uh, leverage can be dangerous, right? So every ten years or so, uh, stock market crashes, and we're reminded of that. But I think there are a few occasions and a few applications of leverage if it's used correctly and cautiously, we can we can even reduce risk. So uh, think about an investor, uh, say a young investor. Say imagine Karsten ten years ago, and um, imagine I have a hundred percent equities, and uh, I want to diversify some of that equity risk. And by the way, it might already be internationally diversified. So, so I've already done all of those levers. But how do I diversify that equity risk if I'm already maxed out, right? So somebody, so in, in traditional finance, so somebody will say, well, you have to sell some of your equities and put that into bonds, right? I mean, you look at uh, this efficient frontier diagram, on the one end you have bonds, and on the other hand you have stocks, then you draw your efficient frontier. And then if you want to, uh, reduce your risk, you have to move along this efficient frontier line. And uh, unfortunately, you face this opportunity cost. If you want to invest more in bonds, uh, you're also going to lose some of your expected return from your equity market portfolio. So in that sense, to overcome this, what I have suggested uh, is why don't you just buy the diversifying asset on margin, right? I mean, don't buy more equities on margin, right? That is the that is the dangerous leverage, right? You don't want to do that. That could wipe out your portfolio if the drop is big enough. But if you use the leverage to buy the diversifying asset on leverage, and at least over the last 40 years, um, bonds have been more or less either uncorrelated with stocks or have been even negatively correlated with stocks. So in that sense, you can uh, buy the diversifying asset on leverage. And is, what you can show is you could actually expand this range of the efficient frontier if you allow 
for a little bit of leverage. So this is this is one point I once made in a in a blog post, and there's there's some additional finance theory. So what you could do is, which is even better, uh, you look at this efficient frontier diagram, and you look at where is the tangency point, right? Where is the point where you have the highest sharp ratio, where you get the highest return per unit of risk you're taking on. And then you take that tangency portfolio and you start levering up that tangency portfolio. And whereas the efficient frontier line, it bends to the side, to the unattractive area, this, uh, this, this tangent line at the, uh, at the highest chart ratio portfolio, it just moves up uh, um, linearly. So, so there are actually points in this um, risk versus return trade-off that are attainable with leverage that you wouldn't have been able to attain without leverage. So that that, that was a there was a point uh, that I made, and it's actually more than just a just a purely theoretical uh, uh, point I raised there. I, I don't think that any any one of my readers has ever implemented it th- that way. But uh, so at the place where I worked, we had a product like that where we said, look, um, instead of, so our target return was a 100% equity portfolio. But what if we are allowed to use some leverage um, between stocks, bonds, and cash? And uh, so we had a product like that. And I think by the time I left, it had a 29-year-long track record. And it had, a, had an average outperformance over the equity index by three percentage points. And it had about the same risk level as the equity index. It had an extremely high correlation with the equity index. But by playing around with the equity weight and the bond weight, and sometimes you take more leverage, sometimes you, t- you take less leverage, you could squeeze out a little bit extra return by doing this smart allocation between stocks and bonds. And of course, well, this was run by a large institutional asset manager. I mean, this this would be something that I probably wouldn't want to touch myself because it, there, there's actually some, there's a lot of computer code that was involved with that. Um, but uh, maybe without all the bells and whistles, you can still outperform probably the index by maybe a percent and a half to two percent, and then that additional that that three percent outperformance that was that's why you have to pay uh, and a professional asset manager. But uh, yeah, I mean this is this is not just a theoretical little gizmo, right? This is something that um, people have used in in real world financial applications and uh, that, that's, that's actually one of the one of the longest running and one of the most successful products that we were selling to uh, to big institutional investors so this is this is this is not just an idea this is this is something that people actually use but then again it's it sounds easy in theory right but you still have to have um, some gauge on expected returns and you have to have a gauge on what is the expected correlation between stocks and bonds right so you have to uh it it, it takes a little bit of time and effort to to monitor that relationship and how high or how low that correlation is so it's it it, it is an active strategy so this is this is not something that uh that the average passive retail investor would want to touch but just as a just as a discussion starter, I, I wrote that blog post, and uh, it's. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm I'm glad you you found this when you <laughs> looked through my blog. <laughs> now uh, there, there's a book out called The Value of Debt. I don't know if you've ever read it, but the basic idea behind it is for those who can handle it and can get relatively favorable terms on the debt. Uh, that an amount of 15 to 35% of the value of your investable assets in debt is kind of an ideal amount of leverage. Not too much risk, but enough to boost returns significantly. What do you think about that amount of leverage in a portfolio? Uh, Yeah, I don't think that there's any fixed amount, right? I mean, so for example... I know a lot of real estate investors, and they did just fine during the global financial crisis. And I mean, obviously, they didn't go overboard with their leverage. Uh, so yeah, I guess it depends on the asset class. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be opposed to uh, a little bit of leverage. Um, so, for example, uh, it, it goes back to this question of uh, what is the optimal asset allocation over the life cycle, right? So, imagine you start as a 20 or 25 year old. Uh, with zero assets and you're saving for retirement, uh, you can actually show that uh, 
your first year of contributions, you, you almost want to be, you could be as high as maybe 10 times leveraged. Um, if, if you were to uh, do this as a, as a mathematical optimizer and you had no leverage constraint, you, you might even get much higher than 15% leverage. Um, and um, yeah, I would probably, but you will reach a point in your uh, in your life where um, you probably want to have no leverage and uh, less than 100% equities. Uh, and uh, so, it, it, yeah, it depends on, on the personal situation. Uh, 15 to 30% leverage is, is probably, you can go much, much more than that if you're a very young investor. Um, and um, if you're close to retirement, you probably don't want to be uh, 15 to 30% uh, leverage again. So it's... You know, it's it interesting on really. you mentioned that. It's interesting you mentioned that. It's a really, uh, it, it, theoretically, it all looks great, right? I don't know if you're familiar with the tale of a boglehead by the name of Market Timer, who was a grad student <laughs> uh, in 2008 in finance or economics or right. something and decided to put right. this to the test. And it, the idea was, well, you know, I don't want to have all this sequence of returns risk. I don't want all this money in equity just as I'm on the eve of retirement, I should spread that out throughout my life. And so he leveraged himself up, right. you know, in grad school, essentially, with all this debt. And then, it, it, of course, he did it right before the whole 2008 meltdown. And you can follow it in real time on this thread on the Bogleheads forum. And, and he basically ended up melting down completely and, and, and lost it all. Eventually climbed back out of it, you know, through saving and working and investing. But it's really a, a, an right. eye-opening caution to applying things that sound really great in theory and then in practice don't always work out so well. Right. And, and, and again, there's, there's probably a more measured approach would have been okay. Right. If he had, uh, instead of investing, because what would have been his income as a grad student, right? So, uh, if, if he had already leveraged, levered his first year salary as an assistant professor in economics or an assistant professor in finance that's a big chunk of money but if he had just levered up 2x the contributions to say a Roth IRA that and I think in a Roth IRA you probably don't want to lever anyways uh, but uh, if, if he had just levered up his then income and contributions he might have been fine but i think he went a little bit overboard with the uh with the leverage and that's that's what killed him and the the other thing i'm pretty sure what killed him is that once it started moving a little bit against him he became too aggressive and probably even doubled down and that's that's also a really big uh danger and uh, that you you think well the market is wrong and I'm right and of course the market can stay wrong longer than you can stay liquid and especially if you're a grad student uh, and <laughs> right. uh, yeah so and that's exactly I, what I, happened I, to him right. so that's uh, yeah it's a cautionary tale um, be careful with leverage yep yeah. At any rate, we're we need to wrap up. We're over an hour at this point, but you've got the ear of thirty to forty thousand high income professionals, mostly doctors, who are going to listen to this podcast eventually. What do you want to say to them that we haven't already talked about? Yeah, so we covered a lot of uh, a lot of material and a lot of the technical issues. And and one thing that I always want to make sure that people take away from these kinds of conversations is that the people in the fire community tend to get a bad rep. So, so there was this uh, New York Times article uh, where they featured a lawyer and who lives like a real penny pinch, right? She buys only brown bananas, and then she borrows uh, the the Netflix account logins from friends and relatives. And uh, I, I think it's uh, don't be distracted by that, because then people get the wrong impression that the only way you can retire early is by being a penny pincher like that. So and the. Uh, and then also, sadly, right, if you look at some of the, the fire blogs, um, th there's a bit of a selection bias, right? So the, the people that retire the earliest were the ones that were the most extreme. and But the overwhelming majority, right, 99% of the people that you're going to encounter in the fire community are, are people just like me, right? I mean, you, uh, we were not overly frugal and we were not overly uh, frivolous with our spending. And uh, we lived very lavishly while accumulating assets over over 10 years while I was at BNY Mellon 
And nobody had any idea that we were particularly frugal. And uh, nobody noticed that we were particularly frugal. So you can actually reach fire in, say, 10 years uh, without uh, depriving yourself of any fun. So we had, and by the way, I probably I could have reached early retirement maybe two or three years earlier than that if I had deprived myself, but I didn't want to, right? So um, smell the roses, uh, have some fun along the way. And then in your retirement, also uh, make sure you uh, don't uh, have too tight of a budget uh, because you have more time. <laughs> more time means you have more opportunities to spend money potentially. Um, so anyways, I, I just wanted to leave people that uh, with that thought that, uh, especially in our community, right? Because as, as we mentioned at the beginning, right, we were almost, it's, it's very, there are so many parallels, right? My first few years at the Federal Reserve, it's okay paid, was not very richly paid. It's almost like an intern uh, and then hit it big and uh, worked for Wall Street uh, and then had basically a, a doctor's salary. And uh, so uh, live like an intern, at least for a few years, or maybe slowly slide it up. And uh, it makes it much easier to uh, to reach early retirement. And uh, as, as anybody can do it, uh, and uh, especially our community and, and, and your community. Yeah, awesome. That's great advice. Well, Karsten, Big Earn, <laughs> Dr. Jeske, whatever we're going to call you, thank you so much for coming on the White Coat Investor Podcast today. Okay, thank you so much for having me. All right. That was great to talk with them. I hope that didn't go over the heads of too many of you. That was a little more in-depth discussion, I think, on finance than we've had with a lot of our podcast guests. But I like to get in the weeds every now and then. I hope you do too. Uh, if nothing else, it shows you that there's a lot out there to learn and always, always will be. Our sponsor today is 37th Parallel Properties. There's a substantial body of evidence supporting commercial real estate investing. Through the years, as I gained a deeper understanding of the asset class, I added more and more to my portfolio, but unless you want to manage it yourself, the real trick is to find a trusted investment sponsor. As one of the good guys in the industry, 37th Parallel Properties is a partner I trust. To check them out, go to whitecoatinvestor.com slash 37 parallel. If you are looking at this upcoming uh, student loan holiday deadline and you're not sure what to do, we recommend studentloanadvice.com. You can receive a customized student loan plan using the principles of the White Coat Investor. You can have a professional guide you through the best options to manage your loans. You can save hours of research and stress and potentially save hundreds to thousands of dollars with your custom student loan plan. If you need advice on what to do with your student loans, go to studentloanadvice.com. If it is just time to refinance them, go to whitecoatinvestor.com under our recommended tab or our recommended student loan refinancing companies. If you go through them, or the end of the month, you'll get not only cash back, you know, as long as you're refinancing at least $60,000 in student loans. And, uh, and you're also going to get our fire your financial advisor online course, absolutely free. So that's an $800 value plus the cash back, which varies by company. Um, great reason to go through those links rather than directly to the companies, aside from the fact that it helps to support the white coat investor. Thanks to those who leave us five-star reviews and tell your friends about the podcast. Most recent review from Heather Bow says, awesome content, great mix of topics and engaging guests. This podcast presents actionable tips that can easily be implemented. Five stars. Thank you so much for that, Heather. For the rest of you, keep your head up, shoulders back. You've got this and we can help. We'll see you next time on the White Coat Investor Podcast. My dad, your host, Dr. Dahl, is a practicing emergency physician, blogger, author, and podcaster. He is not a licensed accountant, attorney, or financial advisor. So this podcast is for your entertainment and information only and should not be considered official personalized financial advice.